Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. With the growing population worldwide, waste management practices have focused on giving waste a second use, especially plastic and metals. This is the case of the Swedish company Seesav and its waste burning facility, which is not only capable of collecting and reclaiming useful material, but also generating useful energy from waste. At Seesav, which is a company owned by 40 municipalities, our mission is to treat uh, waste as sustainably as possible. The material deposited by the trucks in the bunker consists of non-recyclable waste, mostly organic matter, which is ideal as fuel for energy generation. The said material is normally obtained after CSAV has managed to separate all the reusables. So this is the bunker where we take in all the combustible waste that we're going to turn into district heat and electricity. As the dry organic waste gets dumped in the seesaw bunker, an operator in a control room moves this non-recyclable material with a waste crane. With this tool, the operator must constantly stack this waste, considering that he receives waste from 620,000 people. We have about 400 trucks coming every day, and we are totally in a year incinerating close to 600,000 tons of waste. The precision and response of the controls make handling the trash easy, seeming like an extension of the operator's arm. Besides, the shape of the claw allows the operator to grab the largest amount of waste without leaking. All the plant areas are constantly monitored from the control room where several engineers verify the performance of each process. In addition to stacking waste, the bunker operator's main function is to feed the furnace chutes constantly to maintain optimal fuel levels for incineration. When trash enters the ducts, it accumulates on a sloping grate, where it dries, evaporates, and burns. With this material and a constant supply of oxygen, furnace temperatures can exceed 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. We get a temperature of 1000 degrees Celsius. The smoke and the heat travels up into the boiler where we then take in water to the dome. We get a steam with a pressure of 40 bar and that we will take into the turbine 
driving the generator and we will produce our electricity. Through these processes, CSAV produces a total of 1,000 GWH annually. This is mainly used by the nearby population of MoMA and its Burlove suburb. So we don't only produce electricity when we burn the waste, we also provide the district heating grid with heat. As with other plant processes, incineration is monitored with a camera, in addition to temperature and pressure sensors. This control room also verifies the status of the conveyors that move material throughout this section of the plant. Eventually, this product will be sold for use as fill material in construction projects. Thanks to these processes, CSOB provides the population and nearby industries with useful materials. When we incinerate waste, we produce district heat and electricity, but we get some byproducts as well. You get bottom ash, what's left after the incineration in forms of glass, stone, ceramics and metals. We even recycle the bottom mash. The metal found in the bottom mash, we take out automatically and we sell that to companies who recycle the metals. There's a lot of metals to be recovered from the bottom mash and we are very successful in doing so with the very modern technology and we get out a lot of metals every year from the bottom ash. So this bottom ash, we're now going to put into our recycling plant for bottom ash, where we're going to take out the metals. Those are very valuable and we can sell those so they can get recycled. It's like an urban mining of a sort. Places like Seesaw are a clear example of how to transform this waste into a source of resources for the population. However, some wasted materials are more difficult to treat and have inspired new solutions for their repurposing. This happens with companies like Free Recycle, which has created solutions with discarded tires in Nigeria. After acquiring tires through sources like roadside mechanics or automotive repair shops, the company starts removing its inner metal wires using a debeating machine. Without those wires, the tire is easier to process in the shredding machine, where the rubber is chopped into several pieces. This machine has several meshes designed to separate smaller pieces from larger chunks.
However, some large parts can slip, so the conveyor bars vibrate to help workers identify those pieces and remove them for reprocessing. We're trying to contribute our quarter in saving the environment because yearly millions and millions of these tires are burnt. So what we try to do is to withdraw those tires. The more we buy, the lesser tires that will be burnt and the lesser impact, um, the lesser effect it will have on the environment. As the material passes through the production line, its size decreases, thanks to the use of grinding rollers. This is accompanied by a system of magnets that remove any trace of metal between the rubber. At the end, the line ends with small particles of various sizes, which are sorted by diameters from 3 seconds of an inch to 3 sixteenths of an inch. The finer particles are placed inside a drum mixer where they are mixed with a polyurethane additive. In this way, a resistant material can be obtained for the production of rubber tiles. Additionally, using this material as a binder gives it resistance to the climatic conditions and high temperatures of tropical places, like Nigeria. Once the mixture is prepared, the workers are in charge of pouring it into the characteristic H-shaped mold. Such a shape allows the tiles to interlock and reduce the possibility of shifting, especially when receiving the constant load of people and possible vehicles passing through. Initially, the molds are manually pressed to ensure they have the required density. Then, compacting machines are used to remove any air inside and increase the bonding. This requires pressures typically ranging from 100 to 300 tons depending on the tile's density. We have two lines. We have the tile line where we produce the pavers. That, that's what, what you see here, the, the pavers. And we also have the mat line where we produce the mats products, foot mats, rubber rolls and the likes. Um, so we have those two lines. By processing up to 150 tires per hour, this company has enough material to diversify its products, from playground surfaces to sandal soles. This is not only a means of recycling waste, but also an opportunity to provide employment to the nearby community. Thanks to the dedication of these people, the company can offer high-quality products derived from recycled tires. Put it on the machine and cut to the size we want it to, to be. So once that is done, we can now take it to the punching line. We have a punching machine where we can punch it into different things we want it to. Maybe foot mats, maybe flip-flops, maybe rubber rolls, whatever. We'll just we punch it into different things that... Um, Certain products require different methods of processing rubber, such as rubber mats created with plastic punching machines. Those mats are piled up in the warehouse, 
and can be used directly as flooring or as raw material for sandal production. These recycling and waste management processes demonstrate that they can serve as a means of economic support for the community. However, the working conditions of people who work in this industry are not the same in all parts of the world. This is the case of the scavengers in Indonesian landfills, who make a living by recovering any material in these mountains of garbage. Despite the health risks of working in an environment surrounded by this waste, scavengers continue to work because it's their only economic means. For these reasons, people like Rohetti take the risk of venturing into these mounds, looking for plastic, paper, or metal to sell. While roaming through the waste, Rohetti fills the basket on her back using tools like hooks or rakes. Ya, kadang 70 ya tergantung ininya sih. Tergantung kalau kita getol ya dapat 80. Kalau ya kita mangkatnya siang ya dapatnya 50 atau 60 gitu aja. As landfills are full of toxins and biological waste, Rohetti minimizes her exposure to those hazardous materials by dressing with several layers of clothing as well as wearing gloves and in some cases a face mask. Apa juga laku kresek apa semua kertas apa juga di sini laku semua. Bekas apa baju apa bekas juga laku semua di sini. Enggak ada yang enggak laku di sini. She along with other scavengers takes advantage of the movement of the trucks that pile up garbage. While they move, they can leave useful material that they can be exposed to. Rohetti has several bags for each type of material it recovers, making your task easier when selling this material to scrap dealers. Despite how diverse the methods for treating waste can be, there is an innate need to seek solutions to this problem and see it as a source of income and development. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.